Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about righteousness. Now, in today's class, we're going to come out of the book of First John. Now, this is a New Testament book, as the majority of you guys know. But it is a book that you don't hear about too much because it speaks to righteousness. And as that is the focus of today's class, we're going to look in the book of First John. I'm not going to touch on every verse. In fact, I'm really going to go and pick out selected verses from the book of First John. But then I'm going to go in and do some cross-referencing to some other books. Like I said, this is a New Testament class. But we will be jumping into the First Testament or the Old Testament. And maybe, I don't know, we may even touch on the Third Testament of the Bible. Now, I do understand that, that this is a very touchy subject. Talking about righteousness. And let me show you why. And for that, I'm going to jump over to the book of Romans and chapter 10. And look at what the problem is. Now, you're looking right there at verse 1. You guys can read along. Now, what this is, is Paul explaining to us that it is his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. Now, I, wanna, I don't want to take this too slow, but there are some important key words in this verse that we need to understand going forward. Not only in this video, but going forward in life. First of all, when it's talking about Israel there, it's talking about spiritual Israel. It's not talking about the bloodline Israel, those people that were chased out of Jerusalem way back there in 685 AD. And it's not talking about the nation of Israel, who are those people who are coming back to Jerusalem as of the 1940s and even until today. It's talking about spiritual Israel. Now, spiritual Israel is a term that you hear about in the Third Testament of the Bible. There is a chapter, chapter 39, that compares earthly Israel to spiritual Israel. This is also the chapter where you hear about the 144,000 because they are members of this spiritual Israel as well as that multitude that no man can number. Now, here is one place that you see the word spiritual Israel is telling them to become the guides of humanity. Like we said, spiritual Israel, these people are the 144,000. They are the multitude that no man can number. They are the people that's going to be saved. But when you look here at chapter 39 of the Third Testament in verse 14, it explains who spiritual Israel is. It says that they are scattered all over the globe. And it says, these are the people, male or female, who receives charity from our father, feels our father's presence, feels his presence, is sustained by his bread, talking about his word of God, and awaits him. These are the characteristics of spiritual Israel. And this book goes into more detail on that, but we'll save that for another class. And the other word that I wanted to talk about in here is the word saved. Now, this word here is misunderstood, guys. You know, see how even in the book of Romans is using it as a past tense word. So you have people walking around talking about I'm saved. Well, you know, you ask them, you say saved from what? Because the events to which they are to be saved from haven't occurred yet. We're talking a futuristic event. We're actually talking about the tribulation or the apocalypse. Where the majority of humanity will be thrust into the spirit world or will die as some people say. There's only a select few that will be saved. And who will they be? Spiritual Israel, like we just talked about. That multitude that no man can number, plus the 144,000, will be saved alive, will be alive at the end of the tribulation to go on, just like Noah, to repopulate the earth. We have to understand that that is our father's plan. But look on down here and we'll start to see some of the error as Paul explained it. You see right there in verse 2, he says that a lot of people have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge not according to knowledge and it's odd in the time that we live in there is a few not many that believe that having knowledge of our father's word is error 
that we're not supposed to know stuff like we're somehow supposed to be ignorant of biblical truths and anybody who studies our father's word and understands it are in error these same individuals they may have a zeal of God but it's not according to knowledge and so what have they done you see there in verse 3 that they've gone about to establish their own righteousness their own righteousness that's odd guys that's weird and I say that because of a recent comment that I got on my channel where this lady I'm not going to say her name or anything so I'm not going to show you her comment but we were talking about head coverings and whether a woman should be wearing head coverings and her point was that the words of Paul can't be trusted now we do know that Paul is a self-proclaimed Gentile teacher and that's not who we're really talking about here like we said we're talking about Israel Israel and Gentiles are opposite just like we have a spiritual Israel we have a spiritual Gentile of today who is the opposite you can go back and look at the third testament and 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 figure out who spiritual Gentiles are based on what it talks about spiritual Israel and Paul came straight out in about three or four books and said he was sent here to teach the Gentiles. And she was using that and plus her own information to say that we shouldn't be trusted in Paul. So then I went on to talk to, to her and I said, OK, well, Paul is out. She don't believe in Paul. And then we got to talking about, well, who does she actually believe in? And it turns out she doesn't believe in Paul. She didn't believe in Moses. And because of her words, I addressed to her that, you know, you don't you don't believe in John. You don't believe in Solomon. You don't believe in King, the words of King David, who wrote the book of Psalms. You don't believe you, you, you don't believe in any of the scripture. Who is left if you, you know, if, if, if you don't, if you have rejected all of those authors because you disagree with what they say, what of the Bible is left for you to go by? And the answer is none because she has done what? Let me just read verse 3. It says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And that is what my friend was doing over there. She has rejected, like we said, she rejected all of the biblical authors. She rejected the Old Testament authors. She rejected the New Testament authors. But she wants to be righteous. And so what has she done? She's gone about to establish her own righteousness. And here that is like a leprosy that plagues our church today where you have members who are doing just this. They are establishing their own form of righteousness where they have generally just made up their own rules as to what it means to worship God. Now, while we have this on the screen, I don't, didn't really plan on talking about this, but just as an aside note right here where in verse 4 where it says Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone that believeth. That's talking about how he fulfilled the law. Christ is the word made flesh. And what word is he talking about? The word of God, the scripture. And at the point where he was walking around, the only scripture that existed was the Old Testament of the Bible. Think about that for a second. When he was born, there was no New Testament documents written whatsoever. So if he was the word made flesh, what word was it that was actually made flesh? It was the words of Moses. Our Messiah was the words of Moses, the Torah actually put in a bodily form in a human form so he that he could walk around and be our example of what those words meant that's what it means by the word made flesh like when we look over here in the book of John chapter 1 the gospel according to John chapter 1 and verse 1 says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. This is an extremely important verse here to understand who the Messiah is. When we're talking about how he is the word made flesh, he is the word. You see right here in the beginning was the word. The word came first. The word of God was there in the beginning. If you could imagine our father creating heaven and the earth, who was with him? The word of God was with him and who else was with him? Jump over there in the book of Proverbs chapter 1 and you will see that wisdom was also with him. But look at this part right here. And the word was 
God and the word was God. And so here you have Jesus or the Messiah, Yehoshua HaMashiach, coming as this word made flesh. And again, that word that he's talking about is the Old Testament, because at the time of his birth, that was the only word that existed. So there is our problem. We as laymen, as churchgoers, as believers, whatever you want to call us now, are amongst a group of religions. Several religions are at play here who are not adhering to the way our father established righteousness and are going about to create our own form of religion, our own way of worshiping God, which is different than the way he wanted us to. He wanted us to according to his word. His word is extremely important, but when we start to reject his word, but yet we still want to be religious, now we have to start coming up with other ways to be religious, like making up rules, like you have to go to church, or you have to wear long dresses, or you have to use certain words when you talk, or different stuff that wasn't really established by his word is my point. We have to get back into what his righteousness is. Now, like I said, I want to take this slowly, you guys. Um, you owe it to yourself to hear me out here because I'm not really here to make you my friend. I'm not really here to make you like me. You know, that is not my goal here. I'm not trying to be your American idol. That's why I'm not telling you my name. I don't I don't care nothing about being popular. I'm not trying to show you my face. I'm not because I'm not trying to be famous. The only th reason why I am here is because the father has put it on my heart as my life's mission to help people to survive the tribulation. My point is, is that I can't always be nice when I'm doing videos. Sometimes I have to say stuff that you're not going to like. You know, it's just like a doctor. You know, sometimes I got to give you a shot. You know, sometimes this medicine that you're going to get is not going to taste good. So remember that when you're going through our classes, you know, my job, like I said, is to help you get through the tribulation and sometimes removing those old errors that we have come to know and love will be painful. But anyway, let's go on to understand our father's righteousness. We can jump over to Philippians chapter 2 and look at verse 6. It says, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is the law, blameless. So there you have it. Righteousness is the law. This is where righteousness comes from. Our righteousness comes from the obedience to the law. Now, let, let me just explain in you know, my own words here how this all really works see back when Adam was born and Eve was born even all the way up until the time where you had Abraham Isaac and Jacob mankind depended on their consciousness for their survival meaning they had a inner voice that would tell them the difference between right and wrong that's how people like Abraham Isaac and Jacob were able to stay within the father's favor and stay within his rules even though they didn't have the laws written down as they were given to Moses how did they know those laws if they weren't written down until you get to the book of Exodus? How did they know them way back in Genesis? It's because we had our consciousness to depend on. But what happened was when the third seal was opened and mankind was forced into an Egyptian culture. This is important. Mankind all of a sudden who had been always dependent on our father for their food for their clothing for their shelter for their survival all of a sudden went into Egypt and started depending on man for their food for their clothing and for their shelter during that journey about 200 or some years in Egypt they took on the Egyptian ways of life 
and started rejecting the father's way of life that's why the first thing that our father had to do when he came to get them out of Egypt is to reestablish the Sabbath day and the Passover people had gotten so far away from our father's rules and righteousness and laws that they had forgotten the Sabbath day and had forgotten the Passover and forgotten all of the other rules and not only that but that they had taken on Egyptian pagan religious practices they had started worshiping other gods in all of this they put a metaphoric blanket over their consciousness that's what it means by sin separates us from our God whenever we commit sin it actually quiets down our conscience to where we can't hear it anymore well that happens even today well way back there in the time of Moses all of Israel all of our father's people had quieted down their conscience to the point where they couldn't hear the inner voice which is our father telling them the difference between right and wrong so they didn't have their conscience to go on anymore so what happened our father in his infinite wisdom took those same laws which had been written on their consciousness up until that point and wrote them down on stone tablets and gave them to Moses to teach unto the people that's why we had to have the law in the first place was because we had shut down our conscience well that's what it means in the new covenant is that those same laws which had been written on the stone tablets by Moses will once again be written on our hearts again and we will be like those people Abraham Isaac and Jacob even Adam and Eve knowing the difference between right and wrong knowing what we are supposed to be doing and knowing what we aren't supposed to be doing that's where humanity is going but in order to get to that new covenant in order to get us to where we're going to be where we'll have the laws written on our conscience we have to recover and at least get back up to a certain level of righteousness which means that we have to go back and clean ourselves up so that we can start to hear our conscience again that's what it means by the law is our schoolmaster it is what's going to help us to where we can hear our conscience and then once we can hear our conscience again then we will be ready for that transition into the new covenant where we won't actually need the law anymore I plan on talking about this a little later in the video but I could talk about it now how it seems to me and it have for a long time that the laws would be going away they're not gone yet don't let people fool you the people who tell you that they are gone right now are people who like sin they like breaking those laws they like committing adultery they just like living in sin states and worshiping other gods and doing whatever they want to do and they don't want to be sitting over there looking stupid by themselves so they come out and they try to tell the rest of us that we should put away those laws too that we should run back over and try to get in that sin state don't listen to those guys the, the you look over in Jeremiah and chapter 31 you look over in Hebrews and chapter 8 and several other places where it talks about the new covenant you'll realize that this day hasn't came yet like over here in Hebrews and chapter 8 where it talks about the new covenant you see right here in verse 11 and it says and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for all shall know me from the least unto the greatest meaning when we have the great awakening when we have that rapture moment some people call it when we have that time when the new covenant new Jerusalem that third temple comes down and the laws are written on our heart everybody is going to know those laws everybody is going to know the father everybody is going to know the word and there's not going to be a need for people like me and these other ministers out here to come and tell you anything because you're going to already know it and that's how we know that we aren't there yet because we still have people out here who are breaking the laws who are doing wrong who are not following the instructions given to us concerning righteousness humanity as a whole is not there yet only spiritual Israel is working to be there yet and we like we said are working to get there we aren't even there yet so 
don't let them people fool you you know they're doing so for their own benefit they're trying to protect themselves you know and their own feelings and make themselves feel righteous they don't want that light shining on them and making them feel bad so they're trying to put your flame out is what they're actually trying to do like the book of Romans says they're establishing their own righteousness but then they're going a step further and then trying to put that on you and trying to put it on us now before I go any further like I said this is going to be coming out of the book of John but before we get there I want to jump over and show you what the law is what is the law what is this thing that people keep talking about how we are supposed to reject this law those people that have established their own righteousness and saying that the law is done away with we can do whatever we want saying that God don't care anymore about what we do and all of that what what is this law that it is that they're rejecting what is this that they have trodden under their foot for that we could jump over to the book of Malachi who spells out what the law is in chapter 4 you see in chapter 4 and verse 4 he says remember ye the law of Moses right so we do understand I believe everybody knows that the laws came through Moses these weren't Moses's laws you know Moses didn't make these up it was Moses who received these laws because he was more spiritually evolved than everybody else and he, he if you remember the story he had escaped uh, Egypt and was gone out of Egypt for a long time he had some time to spend over there with a uh, priest his father-in-law was a priest so he was able to um, grow spiritually away from the rest of the children of Israel who was still over there in Egypt and in bondage and suffering because of their disobedience Moses was growing Moses was taking his talents and increasing them well when you look closely at this verse and it's talking about the law of Moses and you want to know what is the law of Moses that we are supposed to remember what is the law that we're supposed to be keeping what is the law it says which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel that is nailing down what the law is now some of you may remember that when you look at the Old Testament of the Bible the first in fact the first five books of the Old Testament there are over 600 different commands you could go in and you could find over 600 different rules, regulations, statutes, precepts, judgments, ordinances, all kinds of stuff in the first five books of the Bible. Starting with to be fruitful and multiply all the way up to killing Amorites. You got all kinds of rules all over the place. But my point is, is that not all of those 600 plus rules are the law of Moses that we are supposed to be keeping when it talks about the law of Moses it's saying commanded him at Mount Horeb and what was commanded him at Mount Horeb that was what we call the book of the covenant you heard about the covenant we didn't talk about the covenant in this class that covenant is what was given to Moses and the children of Israel at Mount Horeb not all 613 laws is my point not all of the rules there's no dietary laws in there there's no sacrificial laws in there this is a very specific set of rules and regulations like they're called over there in Malachi they said commandments statutes and judgments the book of the covenant is a specific set of rules statutes and judgments let me show you just briefly but when you look in in chapter 23 of the book of Exodus which is part of the covenant the book the book of the covenant starts in chapter 20 and it goes to chapter 23 when you get to chapter 23 you start to see the statutes see right there was talking about the Sabbath day and it's talking about these three feasts that we are supposed to keep before the Lord those are the statutes when you come back and you look at chapter 21 and chapter 22 you see the judgments and then of course in chapter 20 we see the commandments 
This is what Malachi was talking about over there when the father told him to tell us to remember the laws given to Moses at Mount Horeb. That is the book of the covenant that he was talking about, the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. So, when all of these people, like we said, they're going to they come in, they're going to jump down in the comment section, they're going to jump in other, some of them sneak over in other videos and, you know, they'll watch this one and then they'll go to another video and, and put their little comment in there or whatever. I think they slick. But, you know, saying that we aren't supposed to be keeping the law. The law has been done away with. Well, before you listen to any of these ignoramuses, you know, before you listen to any of these people who are both arrogant and ignorant, they don't know what the law is, but yet they are willing to speak on it and start talking about it, even start preaching that you're supposed to do away with the law. These people that are doing exactly what's talked about over there in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18, where it says, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven D these people who are telling you to reject the law that's who he's talking about they're going to be counted least in the kingdom of heaven meaning that you know they're going to be ostracized meaning they're going to be shamed meaning you know they're going to look real stupid you know, in the kingdom of heaven, they look real popular now. If you want to have a popular church in nowadays, you know, all you have to do is tell people how they have liberty and they can do whatever they want to do, you know, so that they can live a sinful life all week long, breaking all of the rules, doing whatever they want to do. And then they can come down there to your church and you can pump them up and make them feel like they are righteous and they are holy from spending an hour down there with you on Sunday. Then and then they can go back to their lifestyle, living that sinful life that they've that they that they've already established within their own form of righteousness you can have a really popular church but that's only for today the hour of the conscious approaches the day of the Lord is coming that time like we talked about earlier some people call it New Jerusalem some people call it the righteousness uh, I mean some people call it the rapture some people call it the third temple or whatever when that day comes those people are going to be counted least while it is those people who are telling you that you are supposed to be obeying the law that will be counted great. It's going to be flipped. That's what it means by the head shall become the tail and the tail shall become the head. The time that we're living in now, those people who have established their own righteousness are the popular ones. We've set them up in big huge congregations with big robes and gold chains and microphones and everything. But that time is going away. Because what is the Messiah talking about here? He's talking about the law. This is the Messiah saying that think not that he come to destroy the law. He didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. He came to be the law. Walking around in a human being being a physical demonstration of what it is that we're supposed to be doing. He, he was an example of how it was that we were supposed to be keeping that law. And you see right there in verse 18, he says, not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law. That law is always going to be in effect until the earth goes away. As long as we're here on this earth as human beings, that law is real. We, Even though at one point we will have the laws written on our conscience, it will still be the same laws that we read about over there in Exodus chapter 20 through 23 those same four chapters are going to be will be written on our heart we will still be following those the only difference between now and then is they'll be written on our heart instead of written on paper right now they're written on paper right now if we want to understand what it is that we're supposed to be doing and how it is that we're supposed to be doing it and when we're supposed to be doing it we need to jump over and look at the book of the covenant and read about that but that's that's the way it is now. There's coming a day when we're going to have to go no farther than our own conscience to know what it is that we're supposed to be doing. When we pick up a graven image or think about making a graven image, there's going to be something in us that's going to tell us not to do that. When comes time to get ready to keep the Sabbath day, there's going to be something in us. That, and I, that something is our conscience that's going to remind us of the Sabbath day. We're not going to have to jump over here, you know, and, and read, you know, how we're not supposed to steal. When you have a thought to steal something, that, that conscience is going to jump in and, and um, tell you to stop. Like, like yesterday, you know, 
just to give a quick example, like yesterday, I was watching these videos. I can't remember if it was, it might have even been TikTok or whatever. Um, I was watching this video where this guy was standing at a gas pump. And he was telling you how to put the maintenance codes in the gas pump. He was giving you the codes. He was telling you how to put them in. You know that little keyboard on the on the gas pump. And he was pump. He was punching those in. And you know at the end of it, he was saying, "And now you can fill up your gas tank for free." And you know a number of years ago, I I definitely would have tried that. But as soon as as soon as he said the word, "And now you can fill up the gas tank for free," I was sitting there going, "That's stealing." That. And I immediately clicked off the video because my conscience said that is stealing and I wanted no part of it. And so I clicked off of it. That's what that's where we're heading. Not only that rule about stealing is going to be brought to my remembrance by my conscience, but every single rule in here, even the ones that I don't understand, will be brought to my uh, my remembrance, your remembrance and everybody else's remembrance on the planet. We're all going to have that inner voice saying, hey, don't do that. Hey, that's wrong. Hey, we're not supposed to be doing that. But that day still is coming. We're still looking forward to that day. That day, that day approaches. New Jerusalem, the third temple. All right. So I believe we've established what the law is. Now let's jump back over into the book of John in chapter one. And let's pull out some of these verses to show how the New Testament actually tells us that we are supposed to be following these rules now we do know that first John was one of the books that made the Canaan but guys if you've studied the New Testament and what books are actually in the New Testament and compare them to the books that were not in the New Testament you will discover a pattern and what that pattern is is that the books in the New Testament give us wiggle room as to whether or not we are supposed to be keeping the law. That's why there's so many people tripping over Paul right now saying that Paul said we didn't have to keep the law. I believe that that was intentionally done by those who canonized the Bible. Don't let nobody fool you thinking that God canonized the Bible. Our father who wrote and inspired the scripture did not pick the books that will be included in what we call the Bible. The King James Version of the Bible, whatever translation of the Bible that you read, it has 66 books in there. God had nothing to do with what books are included in that Bible. He inspired all of the books. There's over there's hundreds of books that he inspired, that he wrote, that he wanted us to follow. It was Constantine. It was the Catholic Church that went in during the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Trent way back long time ago in like 300 A.D. or 500 A.D. They sat down and brought all of the books. They had gotten all of the Hebrew priests and brought all of the books down there and they laid out all of these books on this table. You can imagine this huge table with all of these scriptural documents in there and here you have these Catholic people stress this Catholic churches who are now deciding which books will be included in the Bible and which books would not be included. They didn't invite God to that party. They didn't invite the Messiah to that party. They didn't consult the Father. They chose the books that will be included. They chose them books for themselves. And it appears to me, and if you look close, I'm sure it will too, it appears that they chose the books that gave them wiggle room. That made him think that you don't have to pick, you don't have to, why, I mean, why would they pick Paul instead of picking Baruch? Why did they pick the gospel according to Luke instead of picking the gospel according to Thomas or the gospel according to Philip? You know, why did they, le why did they leave out certain books and which actually tell us directly that we're supposed to be keeping the law and only put books in there that seem to say, you know, what, we don't really have to keep the law. Each one of those books in the New Testament, you can point to some ambiguous verse that seems that somebody can use and say that we're not supposed to be keeping the law. While the ones who don't have those kind of verses, hundreds of other books they could have chosen, they left those books out. I believe they did it intentionally 
guys I, I do I believe they did that intentionally so that we can be here where we're at now where you got these people who look religious smell religious sound religious telling us that we're supposed to be disobeying what the word of God says and we ain't supposed to be following the scripture at all it, that, that's what that's the books that they chose but I think the book of John slipped through their fingers. I don't think they read the book of John too well. I think that's one that actually got away from them. Books like John, those ones back there close to the book of Revelation, books like Jude, books like Peter. Um, you know, you start to read between the lines of those books and it starts to paint a different picture. Like, you know, different from what Paul was saying back there. This book's seem to say that we are supposed to be keeping the law we are supposed to be obeying that rules and let's jump down through some of these scriptures and let's look at that right quick like I said I don't want to touch on each one of these verses there's really only a few that I want to pull out in the book of first John let me look at chapter 2 and verse 2 and let's just touch on that one right quick you see right there where it says and if any man sin we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous now, I could do a whole class on this, how it is saying that Jesus and the Father is the same person, but we'll save that for another class. In this one, we want to talk about what was the purpose of Jesus Christ, what was the purpose of the Messiah. Sure, he was an example. Sure, he, you know, um, sure he was the word made flesh, but you look right here, here is one of the main things that he did for us. He is our advocate with the Father if any of us should sin. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that Jesus made it so that we can sin and do whatever we want? We don't have to worry about the rules anymore because Jesus died for our sin. That ain't what died for our sin means. What this means, guys, let me put it in my own words, is when after we have read and understood the book of the covenant and or we have the laws written on our heart, but yet we slip up. And do something wrong, say something inappropriately, do something inappropriately, think something inappropriately, make a mistake, make an error. Now we have the Messiah to step in and to help us to step in and to help us to get our sin forgiven. And how does he do so? By saying Jesus, Jesus, Jesus long enough. No, you have to go back and you have to remember what he did there at the Passover supper. You remember that wine that he told us to partake in every year? That wine represented his blood, which was necessary for the cleansing of our stains. It is during that Passover feast is symbolic of us killing a lamb for our sins and doing a sin offering or sin sacrifice spreading blood all over the all over our temple we now drink of that wine at Passover spreading his symbolic blood all over our inner temples once a year once a year we get this we get our sins forgiven during the feast of Passover by way of the Passover communion that wine that we drink on Passover it says in verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see right here that propitiation means the action of perpetuating or appeasing a God, a spirit, a person. So he is appeasing for us. He's going before the father and helping our sins to be forgiven or atoned as it says down there he's giving us atonement for our sins he's not saying that we could just do whatever we want to do no like we said after we have attempted to do the right thing but we have yet made a mistake now we have a perpetuator now somebody stands in before us he he is somebody who will go before the father and say no nope, this is a good guy even though he might have made a mistake he might have did something wrong. He might have committed a sin here today. This is a good guy. Don't punish him for that sin. Give him grace. Give him mercy. That's what our Messiah does. But is he going to do that for just anybody? Any For the person who says, you know what? I have liberty. I can do what the blankety blank I want anytime I blankety blank want to. No, that ain't who we're talking about. 
he's talking about his people who are otherwise trying to do the right thing. Look at verse three. He says, and hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So is he doing this for the people who don't know him? Is he a perpetuator for the people who don't know him? Maybe so. I don't know. Maybe so. It does say right there, but also for the sins of the entire world. But you have to remember that the sin state of the entire world is going away. You know, after this tribulation, after this apocalypse or whatever you want to call it, there are going to be no sinful people on the planet. Everybody that's going to be left are going to be people who keep the commandments and obey the rules. But anyway, let's look down here. At verse three, it says, and hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So those people who are going to be in the comment section of this video in the comment section of other videos saying that we aren't supposed to be keeping the commandments. We aren't supposed to be obeying the law. We got liberty and all of this other junk. Look right here. They don't even know the Messiah. They don't even know who he is. According to what we read in the New Testament, mind you. That the way we know the Messiah, our perpetuator of our sins, who, and who is also our Father in heaven, who created the heaven and the earth, the way we know who he is, is if we keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. Now, that's easily understood based on what we've talked about before. Once we have started to keep his commandments, our conscience starts to become audible we start to be able to hear from our conscience again which is that voice of the father inside of us our conscience is his voice that's how he speaks to us through our conscience well once we keep his commandments we can start to hear that voice again look at verse 4 and he that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him these people are lying to us. They coming in and telling us that we got liberty. We could do whatever we want. We don't have to worry about the commandments. You know, we could do away with all of that stuff, that Old Testament stuff. They are liars and the truth is not in them. They don't they don't have the truth. They don't know. They don't know who the Messiah is at all. But yet they are arrogant and they are willing to come and tell not only us but everybody else that will listen some of these people have whole channels with videos after video trying to convince people that they have liberty to break the covenant and break the rules and do whatever they want well i believe they are of the same people who you know at one point help to pick out these books now to help people to get confused so that these people, when it comes to the day of wrath, won't have a chance of surviving the tribulation. They're going to go on to the spirit world where they're going to spend, you know, some time. That, and, and, you know, a lot of people, they even convince people to look forward to that day. You know, people talking about, you know, how they, they're ready to leave the planet. They're ready to go somewhere else. They're, they're ready to uh, go to the clouds or whatever. That what they're talking about is the spirit world, guys. That's where the dead people go. You know, anybody who dies goes to that same place that these people are looking forward to going. You know, I, why would they why would you be looking forward to your death? You know, you look down here in verse seven. He says, I write no new commandment unto you. But an old commandment which he heard from the beginning. And what beginning is he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. How did they start off? Genesis 1 says, in the beginning. This is the beginning that he's talking about. That is when we start receiving the word. And like John says, in the beginning was the word. This is what he's talking about when he's saying that he gave us new, no new commandment. These are the same commandments that have been in place since the beginning of time. Even before man was created, these commandments were written on the holy tablets. And they're never going away, ever. And that's what John is telling us here. He ain't giving no new commandments. The Messiah didn't give any new commandments. You see right here, people always like to refer back over to Matthew and chapter 22 and said that the Messiah said that we only had two commandments. They're ignoring all of the verses preceding and following this, what they're talking about, which they often do. But when you look here, this lawyer that's talking to the Messiah says, which is the great commandment of the law? He didn't say, what is the law? 
He didn't ask the Messiah, what new law is it? He didn't say, oh, Messiah, now that you're here and have, and have destroyed the law, what are our new commandments? That ain't what he said. This lawyer says, what is the great commandment in the law? So he's talking about the law, which, like we said, is Exodus chapter 20 through 23. But he's saying, OK, out of all of those laws that's in those four chapters of the Bible, which ones are the most important? Not that we can stop the other ones, but I want to know which ones are the most important is what he was asking. And the Messiah told him to love thy Lord God with all thy heart. He says this is the first great commandment. He didn't say this was the first commandment. He said this was the first great commandment. And the second, like unto it, that thou love thy neighbor as thyself. Now you look right here where it says right here in verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So they're intentionally trying to misunderstand these verses saying that the Messiah did away with all of the law and gave us only two commandments to love God and to love our neighbor but that ain't what the Messiah is actually saying here when you read this and you read this entire chapter and you read the entire Bible what it's saying is that that these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets what he's telling them is that you can sum up all of the book of the covenant into those two rules look look over here and how this works so let, me, let me explain just a little bit about the, the the covenant it starts off with the ten commandments that ten commandments that we've heard about it goes on to expound on those rules like for instance the old the, the covenant says do not steal well when you go on into the book of the covenant it starts to expound on that and tell you that stealing don't just mean you know running up into somebody's house you know while they ain't looking and grabbing something and running no actually if you drop something on the ground and I come by you and pick it up and put it in my pocket that's stealing too so my point is, is that it's, it kind of starts off with these Ten Commandments and then it expounds on them in the Book of the Covenant. And even the rest of the first five books of the Bible even expound on them even more. When you get into Leviticus and 23, it starts to expound on them and give you more detail as to what these commandments actually mean and what they're supposed to be doing. They build on each other and build on each other all throughout the Bible. But all 613 different rules, you could bring them all back to the Ten Commandments. Well... What the Messiah is telling them over there in Matthew chapter 22 is that you can sum up all of the Ten Commandments into two commandments. And we look right here, we can see that that's true. When you look at the first four commandments of the Bible, have no other God, make no image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or earth beneath or in the water beneath the earth. The third one is do not take the Lord's name in vain. And the fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath day. Those four commandments can all be summed up in the phrase, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. If you break any of those first four commandments, you are actually breaking this one right here. You are not loving the Lord God with all your heart if you break any of those first four commandments. And the other one is true too, where it says love your neighbor. Well, you can't love your neighbor if you're stealing his stuff. You can't love your neighbor if you're killing him. You can't love your neighbor if you are committing adultery with his wife. You can't love your neighbor if you're bearing false witness against him or if you're coveting his stuff. That's what it means to love the neighbor is to do these commandments. And so that's why the Messiah is telling them over there, you know what? Love your neighbor and love your father are the great commandments. So you can start there and then start to expound on it by way of the Ten Commandments and then by way of the entire covenant and then by way of the entire Torah. And you can Keep expounding by way of the entire Old Testament and the New Testament. But the greatest understanding of what all this truly means will come in the hour of the conscious. After the great awakening 
that time when our conscious will be dominant in our life. And it's going to be different than it is now. Now, if you want to hear your conscious, you have to be quiet. You have to meditate. You have to fast. You have to, you know, you, know, you have to spend time listening to your conscious. But there's coming a day when that voice of that conscious is going to be extremely loud, guys. That's what Revelation is talking about when it says and people will hear voices. Those voices are coming from your conscious. Guys, that's going to be a change in humanity. Like the book of Daniel says, when that happens, some people are going to rise to shame and remorse, while other people are going to be rise to uh, exalted states. It is those people that have taken the time to go in and try to embrace the covenant beforehand that are going to be exalted, while those people who try to say that you're not supposed to be keeping the laws, that you got liberty, they're going to be ashamed. Now, let me jump down here to uh, verse 22, back over there in 1 John and chapter 2, looking at verse 22, because he starts to tell you who the Antichrist is. He says, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So, we read about a few minutes ago that the Messiah is the Word made flesh. He basically is a walking book of the covenant. So to deny him means to deny the law. You think about it. It's true. To deny him means to deny the law. And so what this is trying to tell us over here, this is why I believe that first John slipped through the cracks. People didn't really get this part is that anybody who is denying the law is actually the Antichrist. These individuals acting all religious, acting all pious, sounding all religious and sounding all pious, talking about we have liberty are actually the antichrist and you know it shouldn't be so surprising because who are we expecting in the end times we are expecting the lawless one the lawless one and what law is he lawless of the covenant he is the covenant breaker that's that figure that everybody is is waiting to come to you know wreak so much havoc on the world is defined as the lawless one and again, guys, I believe they're doing this intentionally because they don't want to see you survive. You got to understand, people will sell out on you. You know, they want fame. They want money. They want power. In order to get that stuff, they have to make a deal with the devil. You know, our father doesn't. He That's not part of his promises. He doesn't promise us wealth. He doesn't promise us fame. He doesn't promise us power. N none of his people have that kind of stuff. I mean, I mean. I would say very few of his people have that stuff. I'm going not going to say none because he has set up certain people to distribute his wealth for him. You know, they were made rich so that they can go and help the poor, you know, and that kind of thing. But, you know, for the rest of us who just want to be rich just so we can be rich, we don't really care about helping nobody else. If you want to be rich and be wealthy and be, you know, and have fame you ain't gonna find that in the bible guys the only way you're gonna get that is if you go out and make a deal with the devil and a lot of these people a lot of these especially these ministers you know who are in exalted positions have made these deals with the devil so that they can be rich and famous and ride around in you know multi-million dollar jets or whatever and you know what is part of that deal that they are making they get the fame but their job is to drag many of us into hell with them. There's called, that's the deal. You know, I'll give you fame, but your job is, is to grab as many people, as many souls as you can. And on the day of the wrath, the hour of the conscience, when this, you know, all of these apocalyptic events start happening, these are the same people that Satan wants them to help bring into hell with them. It's like, Big groups of of people that, you know, will be drugged down by these same individuals who, you know, they look so good. They smell so good. They got these big old congregations and all of this stuff, but, act, but are actually teaching against the word of God says. Those are the false prophets that Revelations has talked about that will be cast in the lake of fire. And this is what John is talking about there. See, in verse 26, he's talking concerning those that seduce you. They're seducing us with this law of liberty stuff, guys. They're seducing us, telling us that we don't have to worry about the rules. Go over and read the book of the covenant. You see, it's, it's not nothing in there that we should be abstaining from. You know, like I said, there's no dietary laws in the book of the covenant. There's no sacrificial laws in the book of the covenant. 
those rules should be adhered to those rules should be followed too but my point is is when we're talking about the law when we're talking about the law like you read over there in the book of malachi when it's talking about remember the law he's saying the, the law at horeb so we don't have to remember all 613 different rules we have to remember the covenant those other 550 rules are just going to expound on what we understood over there in the book of the covenant in the first place now look right here we're in chapter 3 of the book of first john you look down there for verse 4 it says whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law for sin is the transgression of the law now see there is the definition of the word sin the transgression of the law so those individuals that are going on to establish their own righteousness they come up with a different meaning for the word sin sin means something totally different for them they had to redefine it because they can't define it based on what scripture says because they reject the law sin is the transgression of the law whenever you break the law you are committing sin that's what sin is not you know some made up stuff you know there's nothing in the covenant that tells you you can't drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes you know those things may be bad ideas but it's not a sin when somebody tells you that smoking cigarettes is a sin they're making up their own righteousness they tell you that wearing a short dress is a sin you don't read about modesty over there in the book of the covenant now I'm not saying you know that you shouldn't dress modestly my point is that the law is the law is the law don't let nobody tell you that the entire Old Testament is the law because they're doing so in order to deceive you you know they try to mix in sacrificial stuff those was for the priests the priests were the ones who did the sacrifices not the common man the common man just basically gave the priests the material to sacrifice and then we could jump down here to um, chapter 3 verse 22 through 24 it's also talking about the commandments verse 24 says and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him see you know those people like I said they're, they're arrogant they're ignorant they're arrogant they're running their mouth but when it boils down to it they ain't even in the father you know that's why that's why they are trying to get off this rock and go somewhere else because they ain't even got no hope in the father they they, they ain't receiving the blessings they they realize that they don't have a chance to be saved through this day and they just want to escape they just want to be gone they just want to be off this planet and somewhere else you know they you know don't do that you know understand that it is through these commandments that we will be saved that's what is the purpose of the law in the first place is that we can can be saved that's what's going to save us is the law i mean i understand you know some people could choke on that but understand my point the in the law the book of the covenant or instructions for survival when you look through that thing you see stuff like you know don't kill people could you imagine what's going to happen to the people in the tribulation who are murderers they're going to be murdered you know they're, they're going to be killed the ones who are committing adultery that's why they call it judgment day people think they've gotten away with stuff you know in the past that they've done uh-uh there's coming a day when you're gonna to have to pay for all of that adultery you're gonna to have to pay for all of that covet covetousness you're gonna to have to pay for all of those events that you know we think we've gotten away from you know in our previous life or previous lifetimes or whatever well it's being saved up for the hour of judgment when the majority of the people are going to have to go away anyway that's going to be the time when they're going to have to pay so following the instructions of the covenant if you haven't done any of that stuff then you don't have to worry about having to pay for any of it right those are the instructions for how to survive those that follow the law will survive while those who don't follow the law are going to be removed from the planet they're going to be thrust into the spirit world they're going to be sitting there with the other dead people but this is the last thing I want to talk about over here this is over in the book of Revelation people are always pick it on me because I'll say the book of Revelations but you have to understand that the book of Revelation is the book of Revelations you know so stop picking on me anyway when you look at here verse 22 
and verse 14 it says blessed are they who do his commandments for they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city this is talking about new jerusalem this is talking about the kingdom age that millennial age that thousand year period where our father will be ruling over the earth there will be no sickness no evil no war no you know government's corruption or anything like that it's going to be a perfect place for humanity to live you know we'll still be getting married we'll still be having babies you know life will go on but you have to make it through the tribulation first like you say you have to be saved that's what it means to be saved those who actually make it through the gates of this city are the ones that will be saved it's a futuristic term but who does it say will be there? Those who do his commandments. Guys, we have to do his commandments. What does it say? Those who don't do his commandments are dogs and sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever make it for lie. And how is that true? Well, that's what the covenant teaches you. It teaches you not to be dogs. It teaches you not to be sorcerers or whoremongers. It teaches you not to murder or to be idolaters. Those, those are what you learn over in the book of the covenant how not to make a lie you know so so it should be real easy to understand those that will not follow the law those that will not keep his commandments those who will not be obedient to the father's righteousness and going on to establish their own righteousness they're going to end up being the dogs the sorcerers the whoremongers and they are not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven they're going to be thrust into the spirit world and like it's funny how you know these people are looking forward to that day like they can't wait you know they jump on my thing is you think 2020 will be the year that the father's going to remove me from the planet i hope not i hope you live i hope you survive I, I would have, well, yeah anyway all right well i'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up um looks like i may end up doing it again in a futuristic video i didn't quite get to cover everything but i think you got the gist of what we're talking about here guys we have to get into the covenant so my advice would be to go in and read it you can listen to it on the audio book or you can flat out read it the book of exodus starting at chapter 20 and go all the way through to the end of chapter 23 maybe even the first seven verses of chapter 24 24 verse 7 is where it absolutely ends when it says all that ye have said will we do and be obedient that's the end of what's called the book of the covenant that's the end of the law that's what we're talking about when you know the messiah said he didn't come to do away with the law when john is saying we have to keep these commandments when you know just about every book, everything talks about the whole Bible is about this law, guys. The people who say otherwise, they ain't reading the Bible. They don't read the Bible at all. If you read the Bible, if they really read the Bible, they would know that the whole Bible is about the law. That's what it's about. It talks about how man was created, how he fell off, how he was given the law so that he could recover. It talks about what he did with that law, gave some examples of what he did with that law. Then it makes a transition into the Messiah coming back and giving us an example of how it was to walk around in that law. And then the, then the New Testament of the Bible basically gives us an example of what life will be like after we make that transition and we no longer have to depend on the written word of the law because we'll have that law written on our conscience all right so hope you got something out of this video if you did go ahead and hit the like button if you didn't go ahead and hit the dislike button but leave us a comment either way and shalom